Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I feel um, ever so nervous now, having heard that introduction. It makes me sound far more glamorous than I actually am. So uh, let's make a start. I have only 10 minutes. Um, what I'm here to talk about is uh, uh, precision medicine, individualized treatments. What excites me, and, and this, uh, this image always reminds me, and I'm sure you've all watched um, uh, science fiction movies or science fiction TV series where humankind overcomes the challenges of not being able to travel beyond the speed of light in order to overcome the vast expanses of the universe and discover brave new worlds. That's very much science fiction. What I want to talk about today is actually more science fact, which is how we're discovering the inner universe the understandings, the fundamental building blocks of the genetic causes of disease, the biological causes of disease, and how those discoveries are helping inform the future of where healthcare is going, which is in fact through precision medicine. Two clicks, my apologies. Okay, so um, how is technology transforming healthcare? Well, I mean, clearly, if you look around this room, you'll notice we are all human beings. I think most of us are human beings, um, we're, which means we're remarkably similar, but we are also remarkably different. We each have different, different genetic makeup. We have different um, medical histories. We have different experiences of life. We have different behaviors. And those differences also express themselves in the way that we experience disease. And it's because of those differences and because of the way that we experience disease that it's critical that we pursue an agenda of individualized treatment and precision medicine. But it's already happening. Artificial intelligence is already writing the next chapter of healthcare. AI algorithms are already being applied across large data sets in health, genomic data, phenotypic data, patient healthcare records, real-world evidence, clinical studies, all of which is providing additional insights to researchers and helping clinicians make better choices when it comes to treating patients and giving them the best possible outcome, whether they be wanting to avoid disease or to reverse the effects of disease or illness. Now, um, I'm going to talk about a couple of examples in a little bit more detail, so cell and gene therapies. So just to ground everybody, cell therapies are about taking um, living cells, so uh, your own cells, usually stem cells or perhaps immune cells, and using those to restore or repair tissues or organs that have become damaged or uh, some way are non-functional through some sort of illness or, or ill health. Then we're going to talk a little bit about gene therapies, and the purpose of gene therapy is to make changes to faulty genes, or what we call genetic mutations that may have occurred, and consequently, uh, through those uh, edits to, to faulty genes, restore health, or perhaps prevent further disease progression. So let's talk about uh, a couple of examples. Um, Restoring vision. Um, clearly, losing your sight is dramatic. It's devastating, not only for you, but for other members of family. It can destroy families and it can destroy uh, experience of life. Now, what we're finding through uh, research is that the causes of, of blindness or loss of sight can be genetic. So you can be born with them, what we call inherited retinal diseases. So patients can present, often early in childhood, perhaps nine or 10 years old, with reductions in their visual acuity. Here you see a patient who's uh, conducting a visual acuity test before uh, a gene therapy treatment, and they're asked to navigate under reduced light conditions through obstacles from an entry point in a room through to an exit point in a room. And you can see the challenge that this presents to somebody that's experienced loss of vision through inherited retinal disease. Through procedures, emerging surgical procedures called um, vitrectomy, it's now possible to introduce uh, gene therapies directly into the retina for patients that have experienced inherited retinal disorders to introduce an, intru an improvement in, in care. And you can see here this same test, how well the patient performs after the introduction of gene therapy to reduce and restore, reduce the effect of the disease and to, to restore some of their vision. So very exciting opportunities present themselves when we look directly at things like gene therapies applied to retinal disorders that have been inherited or things that you've been born with. Switching now to, to a, a battle that we all want to see progress on, and that, and that is the battle against cancer. 
and looking at what's been happening in, in the space of, of cell therapies. So it's now possible to take cell therapies um, and use them as a way of helping patients fight cancer using their own immune cells. So cells are extracted from patients during a complex manufacturing uh, process. Cells are extracted. They're taken to, to facility where edits or changes are made to those cells, which enable those immune cells to target cancer and fight the cancer using the patient's own immune cells. These are called CAR-T therapies. These medicines are already approved by regulators and in use for hematological malignancies or blood-borne cancers. But that stuff, whilst it sounds easy, is not easy to happen without advances in technology in the way that the, the patient's uh, tissues are, are taken, or the way the cells are extracted through apheresis, the, the supply chain complexities of, of transporting those cells to a facility, then the complex process that has to take place to adjust those cells, to then transport those cells back to a clinical setting and have those reintroduced into the patient. You can imagine the complexity and the technological advances that are required in order for us to make that happen. And it's through these in, in, in investments in advanced technologies and new technologies in the clinical setting as well as in the laboratories that we're able to introduce these exciting new therapies and ways of potentially advancing the fight against cancer. This, for us, is a very very exciting space. Now, of course, there's been a lot of discussion here about artificial intelligence, and how is artificial intelligence helping advance uh, precision medicine? Well, in three ways. Firstly, through the application of AI algorithms across large data sets, as I mentioned earlier, phenotypic, genotypic, patient healthcare records, all of which, of course, anonymized or pseudonymized, um, are providing additional insights to researchers to help understand the cause of disease. So if we look across multiple data sets, we're able to better identify the interconnectivities, the interdependencies, and potentially the causes, whether they be genetic or other biological causes of disease, which then allows, and in the case here of, for example, of lung cancer, to identify genetic mutations that are predisposing patients to better or worse outcomes of particular therapies. So that biological understanding of disease. Secondly, in designing druggable targets or therapies that can be used to treat those conditions once we understand what the root cause of a condition is. And again, the application of AI algorithms over large data sets, helping to better understand how we identify those druggable targets. And let me just tell you, for those of you that don't know, it typically takes from the identification of a new molecular entity, a new medicine, about 10 to 12 years before that medicine makes it into the clinic, into the hands of, of physicians that can give it then to patients and help them to uh, restore health. By applying new technologies, AI, we believe that we can accelerate that discovery process, de-risk that discovery process, because the other bit about drug discovery, which you may not know, is it's fraught with risk. Typically, for around every 10,000 molecules that are identified or discovered, only one makes it ultimately into a clinic. So application of, of AI algorithms, of new technologies across, across large data sets can help the de-risk and the acceleration. And then finally, the third way that AI is helping to transform um, the, the, the journey towards um, precision medicines is in the identification of patient. Again, application of advanced analytics or AI algorithms across data sets can help clinicians identify without the necessity for extensive diagnostics or expensive next gene sequencing genetic testing other indicators of where the disease may be. So application of technology is critically driving forward the advancement in the journey towards the adoption of individualized therapies and precision medicine, which has to be the way forward for dealing with a population as heterogeneous as you guys are in this very audience. So it's fine that we do that. We discover new treatments, we advance individualized treatments, or or uh, precision medicines, but how do we democratize that innovation? How do we make it available to the broader population so it's not the benefit of a select few in a few markets or a, sm a few small countries? And I've talked a lot about the application of artificial intelligence algorithms, advanced analytics, uh, supercomputing power across data sets, and uh, it's, it's the data infrastructure that needs to first be in place in order to, for that to happen. So do we have the right sharing platforms? Is information available in order that these advanced technologies can be applied and that that, that data infrastructure needs to be uh, 
uh, built in such a way that it allows for collaboration, collaboration across borders internationally, but also across private and public sector in order to drive forward the advancement towards innovative new treatments. Once we have that, that data infrastructure in place to, to help with those decisions, we also need the application of technologies to help empower decision making based on data. So there is such a plethora, there's such a large amount of information out there. So for clinicians making choices, the ability to read and process and get their heads around all of that information and make the right decision is difficult. But technologies can help empower decision making based again on algorithmic approaches using artificial intelligence or advanced analytics to drive algorithms of treatment for individual patients to help deliver the best outcome. Again, very exciting how technology can help with that transformation. And then finally, of course, we need the right clinical infrastructure in place. So having done all of the work to make these, uh, to develop these treatments, to identify the patients that may benefit, it's absolutely necessary then that we have the right clinical infrastructure in place so the patients can go and get their treatments in a setting that's, that's appropriate and that's adopted to these new technologies. And of course, putting these three things in place creates a virtuous circle. So we have the data infrastructure to help identify the patients and help identify new treatments. We have uh, algorithms to help drive the right clinical decisions. Um, we have the clinical infrastructure to, de to deliver those therapies. And then if we measure the outcome, that feeds back into the data infrastructure, which then again informs an algorithm, and we get into a virtuous circle of gradually making better and better decisions and delivering better and better uh, outcomes. And it is for that reason, for Johnson & Johnson, and for many uh, international biopharmaceutical companies, we believe that the investment in new technologies and the excitement we have around the application of artificial intelligence to potentially transform healthcare and deliver individualized treatment or precision medicines is no longer a thing of science fiction. It's very much a thing of science fact. The future is in our hands and through collaboration and investment in the right spaces, we really think we can make a difference and deliver individualized treatment to the broad population. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day.